Revelation chapter 3, continuing our look at the book of uh, Revelation, the letters to the Ecclesia, and tonight we're looking again at the letter to Laodicea. So we're just going to refresh our memories on that, and we're going to read it together. So that's Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to read from verse 14 down to uh, verse 22. So Revelation chapter 3, commencing at verse 14, and Marion, if you'd like to start us off... That would be great. Starting at verse 14? Okay. Verse 14, yeah. You all got it there? And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then... Because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Are you guys starting yet? We got three. We just started just reading the chapter. Come on, in front. There's some people around here. There's one there. There's two up the front here. Two up at the front? There's Hannah Banana. Look at that. We just have a birthday cake. Anybody want a birthday cake? I'm with right. nuts all over it. Wow. Mm-hmm. Was it Mary? Yes, it was. Yeah. You mean you were up to that? No. 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 <laughs> okay, <laughs> folks. Come in and have a seat. Nobody's there. Nobody's there. Ah. How long do you see? Chit chat after. <laughs> yeah. Um, get on it. It's hard to get moving tonight, isn't it? Lori, there's two over here. We just okay. moved to Revelation. Oh, there's two. Oh, there's two. Yeah, you could, there's a seat up here. Okay. All right. Where do we get to? Verse 4. Verse 4. No, verse, um, 17. Verse 17. Oh, now we're doing 18. Doing 18. Sorry. I brought people with me. I see that. That's good. Okay, so Charlene, you be next. Verse 18. Revelation chapter 3. I advise you to buy from me gold. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thyself, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and will sup with him, and he with me. And that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also the king, <coughs> and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the teacher. All right, so we are looking at Revelation chapter 3, and we just read verses 14 to 22, which is the letter to Laodicea. We've been slowly progressing through it. Um, spent a, quite a bit of time looking at the, uh, the titles that were given to the Lord Jesus Christ, um, the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, and then we looked at, as well, the whole concept <coughs> of um, the beginning of the creation of God. And so we're coming in this week to kind of pick up with the rest of the story, which is the rest of the letter, and we'll see how far we get with it. Um, but I want to just kind of roll back a little bit and pick up where we left off last week, and that is looking at the, um, the reward of the saints, because um, it really comes in at the end of Revelation four, or 3, and we, we sort of jump to the end, and we're going to kind of jump back to the end. Uh, in the 21st verse... Um, where we just read together, it's to him that overcometh, he says, I will grant to give, sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and I'm sat down with my father in his throne. So the reward to the saints is to join Christ in his throne. And that's what we spent a fair amount of time looking at last week. But I wanted to just pick up, because we kind of left off on this phrase, 
Um, as I also overcame. And it's the word overcame, and it's a little bit different than what we have in our King James Version. Um, when you look at the original Greek, it's uh, 3528, as we've been looking at, 3528, and it's Nikeo, which in the form that it's, that it's in in the Greek is in what they call the aortist sense, if you're into Greek. Um, in other words, it doesn't fix a time to the action. So it's an ongoing state. So it is, I am overcoming. And of course, we looked at the word Nikeo, which is where we get Nike from, which basically means victory, right? So it's, I am gaining the victory on a constant basis. And that basis goes on all the way through, as we looked at in, in Corinthians, until the time that he gives up the, the throne to his father, right? So it's a process of overcoming that is an ongoing process, right? It continues on until he hands off the throne to his father. So we are inv invited to join him in this. So I just want to take a look at a couple of verses. We might have touched on some of these. We kind of left off at the end, but Revelation 5. Jonathan, before you get on yep. somewhere else, um, I have a note. I don't know where I got it from. But is that Nikael the same idea as conquering? Yeah, or to victory, conquer? Okay. Um, which is conquering. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. To overcome, to have the victory, to conquer. So you think of the word Nike, it's the same word. So when you think of the logo Nike, yeah. that is Nikeo. Uh, which means to get the victory or to conquer. So hence they've taken it on because if you wear their shoes, you will conquer. Oh, you'll be um, top notch. Theoretically. Oh, that's cool. Okay. <laughs> so, and one more question before we go anywhere yeah. else. What, who, what was the army that were called the Immortals? Whose army was that? Greeks. The Greeks. Okay. Yeah, those were the Greeks. Uh, Alexander's I, army? No. no, it wasn't. It was the 10,000, wasn't it? They were Alexander's. Sparta. Sparta, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. The but what, 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 who was the ruling it? Like, what time yeah. frame was that? The Immortals. I, I think it's actually pre-Alexander, if I'm correct. If okay. I'm, Sorry, that you know, that's Josiah. I think this is a reference to the 300 of Sparta. The 300 of Sparta. I think yes you're and right. no. There is a group called the Immortals, which, which were, were an army. Greek soldiers. Of which some of them may have been part of that, but they yeah. ran. They basically were called the Immortals. They were like the elite, yes. it's like the Janissaries for the yeah. for the, uh, the Turks. Um, yeah, yeah, probably the Green Berets, maybe, but it would be the uh, Praetorian Guard for the um, for the uh, Romans. They were considered, or supposedly at one time, the elite of the elite. Okay. Um, and I think the three hundred are part wow. of that group. Um, but I don't think it's just exclusive to that time period. Well, 300 seems like a bit of a low number, too. Well, that's why they're immortal, because they're just invincible, right? <laughs> and that's what Alexander would do, is he would, put his, um, he would put his best soldiers at the back. So that basically, I've just been reading about um, the Ottoman Turks overthrowing um, the uh, Byzantine Empire. Okay. And they held back their Janissaries, their best soldiers, to the very, very end. And then, as soon as, you know, all the, the young whippersnapper, cannon fodder were yeah. done, yeah. then they'd send in the best troops yeah. at the very end. So this is it's the same idea with the immortals or the, the conquerors. Yeah. So putting it onto a, a scriptural plane, like take it up a notch, you get the phrase of the Lord Jesus Christ who is called the commander of the commanders, yeah. right? So that's his title or... When it says he's king of kings and lord of lords, he's the commander of the commanders. And that comes from Daniel. It comes up again in Revelation. So, because the point is, actually we should just look at that one. It's um, later on in the book. It is um, chapter 19 and verse 16. Because it kind of fits right in with this. So we'll just put it in here. Revelation 19 verse, Wow. what did I say? 16. Okay. Because um, it fits right in. Because he says, as I overcame, you also are going to be invited to join me, right? So, who's next? Where do we get to? Ariel? Okay, Revelation 19, verse 16, if you could read that for us. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
Okay, so there is the title, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Commander of the Commanders, right? Which is what Daniel actually calls Daniel it. 10 and 6. Daniel 10, verse 6, right? So that's another cross-reference, yep. Daniel 10, verse 6. Okay. Well, that's all we've been doing, you know. Tying oh, yeah. Together. It's yep. tying all together. So the yep. point here is that the Commander of the Commanders means that there are multiple Commanders. Ah. Right? So Christ is like the commander over all the commanders who are commanding forces. Mm -hmm. Right? So you've got a hierarchy. The Lord Jesus Christ is at the top of the pyramid, so to speak, with his Father obviously above that. Then you have the saints. Then you have the nation of Israel uh, below that. So, because uh, they become the goodly horse in battle that is commanded. So let's read then Revelation 5, verse 9 to 10. Fred, if you could. Revelation 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book, to break its seals. For thou wast slain, and didst purchase for, for God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. We need to get you a new translation, Fred. Thou made them a kingdom? It's actually That's kings and priests. Yeah. yeah, some of the newer translations throw in a kingdom, yeah, but it's not really a kingdom. No. It's kings and priests. Revelation right? 5. So, um, Revelation 5 versus, is that RSV, possibly? RG? New American. New American? Yeah. No, it's Americans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, Americanos. So, yeah. it should be actually kings and priests, right? That's the, that's the, the phrase there. We're going to be kings and priests, and we're going to reign on earth, right? And this is one of the points we drove home on Wednesday night, was that the kingdom of God is going to be on earth. Right? And we're going to reign on earth because we're going to join Christ in his throne, which is on earth, because it's David's throne that is in Jerusalem that Gabriel promised in Luke chapter 1, verse 32, that he would sit upon David's throne, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And of course, he doesn't do that alone, because Matthew 19, verse 28, Josiah, Matthew 19, verse 28, that throne is extended to... Uh, not just the Lord Jesus Christ, but the saints. So we all get to join in in this. Um, Revelation 3.21 broadens it, but Matthew 19.28 kind of gives you the specifics. Go ahead. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man is <coughs> in thy throne of his glory. Ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So there's the reward that's promised to sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, in the group that was talked to right there would have been Judas. Mm -hmm. And Judas abrogated his right. He abdicated the throne, so to speak. Um, because he gave it up. He gave it up for 30 pieces of silver. That's the price at which he was willing to toss his eternal inheritance as being a commander with the Lord Jesus Christ. So a pretty sad state of affairs. So let's go to um, Luke chapter 19, Josiah number 2, verses 16 to 17. So Luke 19, verses 16 to 17. Yep. Yeah. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. Okay, so and if you keep reading there, we find that there are authority given over different um, amounts, different cities. Five cities. So you got five, you got ten, etc. Okay? which tells you that there is going to be a different set of rewards. doesn't mean that everybody. So you have Christ, who is the king. He is the commander. 
Then under him, you have the 12 apostles. And kind of co-reigning with them, you have saints, you have prophets, who are going to be over all the nations, but you're going to have Israel, and Israel is going to also be over the nations. So there is a hierarchy, a specific hierarchy, to the kingdom of God. Because you're going to have the nations, ten men shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, well, go with you, because we've heard that God is with you. Right? So there is a, there's a real <coughs> hierarchy that's laid out here that is um, something that is really good to, to get our heads around, because it shows us that God is not going to give us more than we can handle, for starters. Um, and that there are different levels of reward. So, if you're faithful over a lot, then you'll be made to rule over a lot. If you're not capable of handling tons, well, he's not going to overload you. He's going to give you what you're capable of handling, and you're very thankful for that. I mean, it's not a question of, oh, he gets ten cities, and I only get five, you know, like, and that's what the disciples were playing at on the night before the crucifixion. Who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And we can easily fall into that trap but the point is, there are different levels of reward that are given to the saints, and we'd like to spend a minute now looking at um, this idea of all the nations over which Israel is going to be the chief of those nations. It is a fallacy um, that we sometimes hear that come the kingdom of God, um, Israel is no different to the rest of the nations. That is not true. That is not the way the Bible pictures it at all, um, because it has very clearly, God has very clearly laid out his plan and purpose, putting Israel at the center of it, because the Lord Jesus Christ is going to reign over the nation of Israel, and they become the center of this whole picture. Let's just go to um, one passage first that I don't... I think I have in my notes. No, I don't. Um, it's in um, Micah, and it's pretty critical because here we see how this rolls out. Micah chapter 4, in verses um, <coughs> 6 down to verse 8. Micah 4, verses 6 to 8. My turn? I yes. Like it. Okay. <coughs> But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. For all people will walk every one in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God for ever and ever. In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halt it, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. And I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Okay, so take note of this. The daughter of Jerusalem is the kingdom, right? To her it comes, and it's called the first dominion, right? She is the kingdom. When you say, well, how can it be that Israel is the kingdom? Well, because remember the words in Acts, right? Chapter 1 and verse 6, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel, right? It's the restoring of the kingdom. Is that what you're going to do at this point in time? He says, well, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has put in his power. So it's not going to happen yet, but it's going to happen. And then you get Acts chapter 3, until the times of the regeneration, or the restoration of all things, which the Father has put in his power, that the Lord will go to heaven until that point in time, then he's going to return. So the kingdom is going to be the kingdom of Israel restored. And it makes perfect sense. Because remember our little model there, 
we had Christ, who is the king. Then you had the administration, which is the, the saints. So, and then, underneath that, you need the people that are going to be ruled over, which is primarily Israel, right? If you don't have a people, then you are not a king. Right? Like, I mean, I can go around saying I'm king, you know, king, is it? Very nice, you know. But if I don't have a people to reign over, I am nothing. Nobody lives at your house. That's right. Yeah. So, like, so you take away Israel from this equation, you have no kingdom. Right? That's why in Revelation chapter 12, or 16, it talks about the drying up of the river Euphrates, so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Israel coming back to the land is the preparation for the kingdom because they're the people over which the saints are going to rule. So you have to have Israel. They are called the first dominion. So if you look at this, this is the first dominion is what Micah says. Okay, so if there's a first dominion, and that's the nation of Israel, they're the, the first dominion, it implies that there is also a second dominion. Right? Yeah. Which is going to be the nations. Jonathan, where does it say First Dominion? It's in Micah, chapter 4, and he says there, uh, verse 8, It shall come even the First Dominion. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. So your translation might be slightly different. Former Dominion. Former, okay? So, yeah, so it's, it's first in, in series, um, but in this case as well, it's the restoration. So it, it is both, but you have the primary is another way of putting it, okay? So you've got the primary and the secondary. Um, the way Brother Thomas uh, explains this in, in, I think it's actually in Alpha Israel, he's, he says, okay, think of the dominion of Canada, mm -hmm. okay? We're the secondary dominion. Mm -hmm. What's the primary dominion? Well, it's Britain, mm -hmm. right? So Great Britain is the primary dominion. And then you have the dominion of Canada. You have the dominion of India at one point in time. You had South America, uh, so on and so forth, or South Africa, sorry. Um, they were the dominions, New Zealand, Australia. Um, you think of uh, Trafalgar Square in Britain. You've got the Nelson's Column. And around the bottom of Nelson's column, you have the lions, all representing the dominions, the four dominions. So the second dominion are those nations that are brought under the control of the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints. So let's go to Daniel, chapter 2, verse 35, and then verse 44. I think, Kara, that's you. So this is the, the image vision, right? This is going to be when the image uh, is, is, comes together. Uh, actually, it's verse, did I say 35? Yeah, so verse 35. It's the little stone that smites the image on the feet and what happens to it. So 35 and then 44. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And then verse 44. Yeah. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here you have the picture. You put the two verses together. The stone is going to smite the image. It's going to grind it to powder. So that's the kingdom of men, as he's described it elsewhere. It's going to be obliterated. And then it's going to become a great mountain. It's going to fill the earth. Right? So this kingdom is going to grow... This dominion is going to grow and it's going to fill the earth. Well, the stone is the kingdom, which we've already learned, is Israel. Now, the king who rules over Israel is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Israel is not a kingdom without a king. 
their state, which is what they are right now. Mm -hmm. Right? So you, you see, like, you can't really divorce these two things from each other. Some people try to kind of like, get all excited because, well, Israel today is not a godly nation and so on and so forth. It's irrelevant. God, you know, look at yourself. 20 years yeah. ago, was I a godly person? You know, God pulled me out of the world mm -hmm. and took whatever wretch I was and turned me into something he can use. Yeah. He's going to do the same thing with the nation of Israel. He's going to take them. He's going to restore them to life. He's going to bring them back together. We're reading Ezekiel chapter 37, the valley of dry bones. And he's going to breathe life into them, his spirit word, and they're going to become an exceeding great army. And they're going to become the stone that smites the image on the feet and grinds it to powder. The stone is comprised of not just the nation of Israel, but the Lord Jesus Christ is the head cornerstone. We are all living stones that are built together with him. He's the center of the whole thing, but he's not a kingdom without his subjects or his administration. You can't have a kingdom unless you have a king, a law, a land, a capital, subjects, right? You need all those things in administration. Take any of those away, and it's not going to work. A king with no administration, who's going to listen to him? There's nobody to, to bring about his will. A people with no king, they're not a kingdom, right? So, like, all those components are fully necessary. Israel is that first dominion. Now, what's amazing is that they are going to be other nations that are going to be in existence, but slowly they're going to disappear. Just take a look at Daniel chapter 7. This is uh, another prophecy. We looked at this a while ago, a long while ago, for those of who were here. Daniel chapter 7, verse 12, right? We read about the, the beasts, and it talks about the, the fourth beast, the Roman Empire, was going to be destroyed. But there's a little comical, not comical, but interesting note in verse 12 of Daniel chapter 7. Can I read it? Yes, please. Okay. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. So notice there, their dominion is taken, but their lives are prolonged for a period of time. Right? So they're no longer sovereign nations because the image has been smitten with the stone. But they're still in existence. Right? So that's the difference. They're okay. still nations that are going to be in existence. As the stone goes out to fill the whole earth, though, we're going to find out that these nations are slowly going to disappear. So let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 11. Now this passage we often use in relation to Israel, 100% correct. But just notice what it says of the other nations. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 11. For I am with thee, saith Yahweh, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whether I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. So here's what he says. I'm going to make a full end of all nations, but not Israel. So Jeremiah is pretty explicit. He says all nations eventually are going to disappear. There's not going to be a Canada, United States, Britain, India, Russia, whatever. They're all going to disappear. They're going to have their lives prolonged for a period of time, but eventually they're going to disappear. Well, how is that going to be? How is it that they're going to disappear? Subjugated by the saints, by the saints yes. That's having their dominion taken away. But they're actually going to not exist anymore, and there's a reason why. Wow. Zechariah 8, the the verse 23. Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 23. Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Mm -hmm. That's the third time I mentioned that last two weeks. 
Yep. So you get the point now? <laughs> They're yeah. taking hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. What does it mean to take hold of the skirt? It means to grab hold of the covenant. Remember what God said in Ezekiel mm. to the woman who was caught in the, or she was cast into the wilderness? And he says, I took you and I washed you and I cleansed you and I brought you to myself and I spread my skirt over you and I brought you into the covenant, right? That's that little quizzical statement with Ruth where it says that she went and lay at Boaz's foot and she put his skirts over him or asked him to cover him with her skirts and people have read a lot into that. What it means is she's asking him to bring her into the covenant, right? So that's what people are saying here when they say they take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, you know, we want to go with you because we've heard that God is with you. Yes, Shirley. Do you have that Ezekiel reference? I think it's 33. You'll just have to give me a minute. It's not 33. It is... It is... uh, It's not 23. I might have to find it for you, Shirley. I did an exhortation at once upon a time, and I thought I marked it up, but I didn't. Where, Shame on me. Where Ruth, is that the one she wants, where Ruth says to Boaz? No, not Ruth. Oh. Although, actually, if I went to Ruth, I'd probably have it marked in there. So... Let's see if we did our homework. Ezekiel 16, verse 8. There you go. Thank you. And since we've got this far, I'll read it out to you. Okay. Ezekiel chapter 16, and verse 8, where I got, and I did have a mark him anyway. Now when I passed by thee, I looked upon thee. Behold, it was the time of thy love. I spread my skirt over thy, thee, and covered thy nakedness. I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord Yahweh, and thou becamest mine. Right? So she became his... As he brought her into the covenant, he spread his skirt over her. So that's the, the idea with the skirt and the cross-reference to Ruth, seeing as we had that one as well, is um, Ruth chapter 3 and verse 9. So I'm just going to scribble them on the board because I don't have them here. Ruth cross-reference So the skirt is Ruth 3 verse 9. And what was the Ezekiel one again? It was Ezekiel 16, 16. verse 8. Ezekiel 16, verse 8. So that's the idea of being brought into a covenant, and it ties into the idea of the skirt, right? So the other passage I just want to look at on this is um, this idea of being brought into the covenant is Isaiah 56 and verses 6 to 7. Because it really is a beautiful picture, and it's a fairly monumental thought is that the nations, we talk about the melting pot, right? There's a melting pot, multiculturalism today, where what everybody does is celebrate the differences, and that means that basically they just end up all being separate anyway. Um, (laughs) But in the kingdom age, it's a different kind of melting pot. It's the melting of flesh, and people leave behind their Canaanite practices. I mean, driving earlier and I was listening to this guy talking about you know uh, the native um, uh, reserves and whatever else and how they try to erase the native culture um, with Catholicism and goodness knows what else and all the abuse that went on there so that's the wrong way of doing it here you have people voluntarily Mm -hmm. leaving behind their paganism which a lot of the native culture really is just like Catholicism is they're gonna leave all that behind 
and they're going to join themselves to God. So Isaiah 56 and verses 6 to 7 explains to us how this kind of takes place. So Hannah, I think if you're, you're there. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord, to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be a servant, everyone that keep the Sabbath from polluting it and taking hold of the covenant. Even them will I bring into my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called in house of prayer for all people. <coughs> Okay, so you notice there what they do? It's the sons of the strangers who join themselves to Yahweh. And notice what he says? They take hold of my covenant. That's Cornelius there. That's what he did. Yeah. And that's what we do. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. The sons of the strangers who join themselves to me, well, we're strangers who join ourselves to Yahweh by taking hold of his covenant, so that as they said to my dad when he was baptized, you know, you've been an orphan all your life, you're an orphan no more, right? Because now you're part of the household of God and the family of the saints, right? So here we have this idea of joining ourselves, and the word there, join, means to cleave, to attend, and it says, foreigners who join themselves to God's people as converts, as a wife joins to a husband, right? So if you think of proselytes is what they're called in the New Testament, that's the Greek word for the Hebrew expression, a proselyte, somebody who joins themselves to the strangers, right? These are people who are joins themselves to the Lord. These are people who are pulled together and joined to the Lord Jesus Christ out of all the nations. <coughs> Right? Well, in so doing, they are resigning their citizenship. Right? They're, they're joining the Lord, and they are resigning their own national identities because they're becoming part of the people of God. So he's going to make a full end of all nations. He's not doing it by extermination. He's doing it by preaching. And the Jews will become the preachers of the kingdom age with the saints. Yes, Tim. I always wondered, uh, when you looked at Revelation 21, and it was talking about uh, the new heaven and the new earth, in verse 1, and the uh, first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So there's, at that point, no more other nations. The Correct. peoples are gone as one, one, one kingdom. However, if you read afterwards in verse 1, or sorry, verse 2, of chapter 22, <coughs> Now verse 1 and 2, verse 1 to 3, I guess. And he showed me a pure river of water, of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, there was a tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. So those nations that are in there are, as you say, totally converted and uh, as, as his people, but they are still nations at this point. So I wonder, well, how was it that we read about there's no more sea, there is no more nations, and then we go to 22 and read there is nations? Because those are the peoples that have been changed, right? I mean, like... When you look at that picture of the, the wood, right? Because it says there's a tree of life on either side of the river right. and in the midst of it, right? Well, the word actually means a wood. It doesn't mean a, a literal one tree. Right. It's a forest, right? right? So the forest is comprised of, as it says in the first psalm, the righteous will be like a tree planted by the river of water whose leaves will never um, fade away, right? right? So it's, it's the righteous that are basically planted by the rivers of water and their uh, leaves are for the healing of the nations because they have taught them and they've healed them to the point that there is no more curse. Right, but, but they still have their identity here. They still are nations. They are one people spiritually. There is no more Canaanite in the house of the Lord, etc. Right. But there are still nations at this point, but they're going to be gone. And um, not considered as nations Correct. later on. And at the point that... Um, 
brother um, um, O'Grady, uh, Mark O'Grady mm -hmm. made it, was when it took us through Revelation was that you have a, an opening section that shows you the beyond, and then you have a development right. to Yes. In yeah. each section of Revelation, you have that opening statement that shows you the beyond, yeah. and then a development to it. I think it's pretty good. And so that reconciles it for me, is that you have this opening statement that shows you what's going to be at the end, but this verse in 22, verse 2, is on the way there. Yes. So, so he develops the end first, and then he gives you the picture of the way. He's done that all the through Revelation. And... Um, yeah. Well, that makes sense, too, because the end of verse 2 says, uh, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So obviously they weren't healed at that point in chapter 22. Well, it is. At chapter 22, you, you are looking at the very end of the situation because he says um, there's no more curse. Right? So you are looking right to the end of the picture. There is no more curse. So you are dealing with a situation where the, the throne of God and of the Lamb are in it. And it goes on to say um, later on that God, uh, well actually it's chapter 21 and verse 3. Um, Behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away all tears. So at that point in time you do have um, the immortality of, of all the peoples. There is no more sea. Like you think of Isaiah, the wicked are like a troubled sea that casteth up the mire, right? Well, that's going to change come the kingdom age. And it's through this process of people joining themselves to Yahweh. Now, the difference is, come the kingdom age, there is still a strata, right? There is still Christ, there's the saints, there's the nation of Israel's. Then there's the nations who join themselves to Israel. But they are in different degrees, right? So they are not on a par with Israel, if you want to call it that. No different than if you think of um, go to Britain during the height of the empire. If I'm a colonial, um, my status is different than a British subject, right? If I'm a, or an actual Englishman, right? There's, there's different degrees of status. And that's the same thing in the Kingdom Age, is that there's going to be a different degree of status amongst the different peoples. Hence that parable we looked at in Luke. You know, one's over ten cities, one's over five cities, but the people in the cities are ruled over by the ones over, over the top. How exactly the whole past that's going to work, we're not told, but during this period of time, we know that there is still a strata that's in place. But you are looking at post-millennial period, because there's no more curse. So there's the whole death has been swallowed up in victory at that point in time. And then comes the end where it says in Corinthians, he will deliver the, the kingdom to his father. So it's a very much a, um, a uh, how would you put it? It's not the way the world looks at it. The world looks at it like a quality. Everything, everybody has to be equal all points in time. But God doesn't look at it that way. There is different degrees um, of reward and there is different degrees of status when it comes to the Kingdom Age. Um, let me just take a look at one other, a couple of other passages just to sort of tie this up. Did you get a picture of that? I did, yes. <laughs> Let's go to Isaiah 14, verses 1 to 2. Oops. Isaiah 14, verses 1 to 2. Whoever is next, if you want to read that for us. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and will and will yet choose Israel, and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives, whose captives they were. And they shall rule over their oppressors. So here you have the strangers that are joined, right? There's people who voluntarily do this. But there are others here who um, the people shall take them and bring them to their house. And the house of Israel possess them in the land of Yahweh for servants 
and handmaids. Right? So here you have the nations, although they are joining themselves to Yahweh, they are servants and handmaids. And you can say, well, you know, is that fair? You know, um, is it fair that God would do this? We need to think about this. The nation of Israel has served the nations of the world for the past 2,600 mm -hmm. years yeah. since the time of Babylon. Well, God's going to reverse that. And now the nations of the world are going to serve them, right? And it's not going to be an oppression like it was under the, the time period of um, the Babylonians where there's cruelty and force. But Israel at this point in time are going to be in training, so to speak, or being infused with the spirit, with the character of God, so that their behavior, although still fleshly and mortal, is going to be under the direction of the saints, and it's going to be one that's going to be godly and righteous. Like they were meant to be the first time around. And, like, you've got examples of this. Hiram, king of Tyre, mm -hmm. yeah. right? He became a servant to Solomon, to David, mm -hmm. right? And other kings, we've just been reading about them in our readings, served Solomon and served David. And then the one king died, and then his son came along and said, well, I'm not going to serve you. And then, the, you know, they came to fight against him, and David whooped them. Then they hired the Mesopotamians, and he whooped them too. And then he hired somebody else, and he whooped them as well, until eventually they said, okay, fine. You know what I mean? Like, and they gave it up, because God was with David. You can see that uh, over and over again. But that's the principle here that they're going to join themselves to God. And there's a reason for it. And they're going to join themselves, actually, uh, to Israel as well. Uh, John chapter 4 and verse 22. And this is, again, it's just dispelling that fallacy that Israel is just like every other nation. They're not. They're going to be in an extremely privileged position because of the patriarchs. Because the promises were given to them and to their seed. That they would dwell in their land and they would be secure. And all nations, right, they would be given the gate of their enemies. So John chapter 4 and verse 22, Lisa, please. We worship, we know not what. We know what we worship. The salvation is of Jesus. So there's your underlying principle. Salvation is of the Jews. Yeah. Why? Because of the promises. Mm -hmm. God keeps his word. <laughs> nice verse connects all this is Isaiah 55, verse 3. Incline your ears, dig out your ears, come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, according to the faithful mercies shown to David. Yes. That ties it all together. Yeah. That's Isaiah 55, verse 3. That's good. I'm going to throw another one on there as well. Romans chapter 11. And it is... Uh, if I can find it. I'm going off the cuff here. Verse 28 and 29. Ariel? Romans 11, verses 28 and Touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's <coughs> sakes. Notice where the apostrophe is? It's plural possessive. I used to read this wrong always when I was a kid, mm -hmm. thinking it was God's sake. It's not oh, God's no. sake, it's mm -hmm. not the Father's sake, it's the Father's sake, right? It's plural possessive. So this is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So although at this point in time, Paul says they're enemies when it comes to the gospel, they're now adversaries to you. He says, when it comes to the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes, for the patriarch's sakes, for the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. He's not going to change his mind. He promised this to the patriarchs. It's not going to change, even though at that point in time they didn't deserve it. 
he still is going to bring about his promises. And that's, remember what he says to Esther? He says, look, um, this is Mordecai to Esther, when she's a little bit nervous about, do I go in mm -hmm. to Ahasuerus or do I not? And he says, look, deliverance will come from another place. But it might be that God's brought you to the throne to this very point. So like he will accomplish his will. Do you want to be a part of it or not? Is really the question. And it's the same thing as uh, Roman, or, uh, Numbers 14.22. It starts off with, we always quote it in Sunday school, the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Yeah. But it starts off with the word, nevertheless. Because it's God telling Moses, I will not blot Israel out for your sake because you've asked me. Nevertheless, I will bring about my purpose. So even though I'm going to keep this people alive, right? I'm going to bring about my purpose. Whether they like it, you like it, anybody likes it or not. Right? So he's going to bring this about. So this is the time period when it is all going to come together. And that's where we get to that picture in Revelation chapter 15. And we've been talking about this. Um, Revelation 15, this is stage 1. 15 and verse uh, 2. So this is coming back to, to Tim's question and comment. Revelation 15 verse 2. So this is at the beginning of the millennium, okay? So at the beginning of the millennium, or kingdom, this is the state of affairs. So, uh, Shoshana, Revelation chapter 15 and verse 2. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and that man had gone the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, so let's just walk through this. A sea of glass mingled with fire. Well, first of all, we have a sea. So, Fred, if you want to look up for us, Isaiah 57, verse 20. Isaiah 57 and verse 20. So we're just looking at the, the sea, first of all, waters. What does it represent? I got again the Bible. This one's falling apart. 57 verse 20. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot quiet. And its waters toss up refuse and mud. So the wicked are like a tossing sea. Is that what we see in Revelation? No, we don't. We see a sea of glass. Okay? Which tells you it's now not the wicked. Are wicked. Right? Why not? Because it's mingled with fire. Well, what's the fire? Judgment. Judgment. Right? Who's been judged? The beast, the whore, and the dragon. Okay? So you've got Europe, the Vatican, and Russia have all come into judgment, so man's way of doing things has been judged. It's a sea, but it's not troubled like it was in the past. Remember the woman who sat on many waters, mm -hmm. right? Well, now it's a sea of glass because it's calm. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ? Peace, be still. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's a sea now that has peace associated with it. Peace be still. Now, I can't put my finger on the verse. It's in Isaiah, I can tell you that much. I'm just going to give you the, the gist of it, and you can find a concordance and you can look it up, because um, I can't remember where it's from, where it tells you the fruit of righteousness is peace. <coughs> So when you get a sea of glass, 
it's peaceful. And that is the fruit of righteousness, right? So there's been a transformation of the peoples of the earth based on the judgments of God who has taken the wickedness out that has been casting up the, the mire and the dirt, right? And the fruit of righteousness then becomes peace. And so this is the, the, the glory of this whole thing is that there is going to be peace upon the earth because the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. And just like he did when he was standing in that... Um, in the, uh, in, the, in the boat when it was tossing around on the sea, um, he's going to turn around and he's going to bring peace. I'm just going to see if I have the cross reference for that, but I can't see it. Yeah, I don't know where it is. But anyway, it's in Isaiah. I can tell you that much. The fruit of righteousness is peace. Now, just think about this. Do you remember what the disciples said to the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on the water? When he said, peace be still? What was it they said? Something about who is this? Why did they say that? He commanded nature. Close. He commanded water. Closer. <laughs> command the sea and waves, roaring. Yeah. Right. What manner of man is this? Even that even the sea, the sea and, and the waves obey him. Yeah. Right? I mean, that is a prophecy about what's coming. Again, I'm ad living, so I don't have the actual passage. But that's the comment that they make, is what manner of man is this, that even the sea and the waves obey him, and that's exactly what is going to take place when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. The sea and the waves are going to obey him. And it's the sea... Uh, blah, 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 blah. Luke 8, 25. Thanks, Lord. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Luke 8... Verse 25. He's so Hollywood. <laughs> what manner of man is this that even the sea and the waves obey him? So you see there's a process that's going on here where we're going from a, a raging sea, the wicked are like a troubled sea that casts up mire and dirt, to a sea of glass which is calm. And it's mingled with fire, and that's why it's calm, is because judgment has happened. Now notice, I want you to have a look at, the way the judgments are described, right? Because it's not just wanton hack, slay, chop. There is a specific uh, way about this judgment, and this is why it is God's judgment that trumps ours. Come to um, Revelation chapter, I think it's 19. And um, verse 11. So this has been the judgment. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. What kind of judgment is it? And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat upon it was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges in and wages war. All right, so in righteousness he judges and he rages war. Verse 7. Revelation verse chapter 19, verse 11. Right? So it's not wanton violence. It's not like he just comes to lay the smack down. He's coming in righteousness, and with righteous judgment he's going to judge. Remember, that's why the Lord says, my judgment is not mine. It's God's judgment. Yeah. And so his judgment is going to bring about peace. What's his title? The King of Peace, right? The Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, right? Let's just take a look at that. This is going right the way back to Isaiah, because this is the kind of people that we have to be if we want to rule with him, right? We have to make sure that we have the same characteristic. So this is going right back to when the announcement was made. Isaiah chapter 9, who's next? Josiah, is it? Yes. Okay, Josiah, <laughs> Isaiah 9, and verse... Um, Let's go with 6 and 7. 
So this is how we get there, is Isaiah 9, verses 6 to 7. If we want to rule with Christ, then this is the kind of character that we have to develop in ourselves. Isaiah chapter 9 and verses 6 to 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the gover government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his gov government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish, establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So you get the point there? Oh, this is the character of God shown in the Son. The government is on his shoulder, right? Unto us a child is born, to us a son is gotten, given. So this takes you right through, through the birth of Christ. Wonderful Counselor is his title. The Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, right? So here we have it. He's the Prince of Peace. The increase of his government is going to be no end, right? So it's going to keep on growing. And it goes on to say, um, Upon the throne of David in Jerusalem, and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice. Mm. Right? You see, so how this is going to happen is that he's going to come, the prince of peace, but peace is not achieved by negotiations. It's not achieved by giving away the land. It's not achieved by licking the boots of Yasser Arafat, the Pope, Obama, Putin, or any other world leader. That's right? Putin. It's achieved <laughs> by righteousness. Mm -hmm. The fruit of righteousness of peace and chiming in is Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 17 is the verse. Um, I'm going to assume that's Hannah, but I'm not totally sure. Um, Isaiah 32 and verse 17 is the, um, the passage. It could be Sam as well. I'm not really sure who that is. Oh, they're throwing some verses at you? Throw me the verse. This one I couldn't cool. find, right? Isaiah 32 <laughs> verse 17. <laughs> So this is the other passage that we wanted to look at. And other Josiah, if you'd like to read that one for us. Isaiah 32, verse 17? Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there you have it. The work of righteousness is peace, and the effect of righteousness is quietness and assurance forever. That's how you get a sea of glass. It's the work of righteousness, right? Now, the fruit of... Oh, yeah, the 18 as well. My people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation, a sure dwelling in a quiet resting place. Right. Okay? So, again, you get the same idea there. Um, the other one is the fruit of righteousness, which is, I think is the one we were looking at earlier, uh, the fruit of the, the, the lip of righteousness. I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it's along the same lines as well. So that's what's going on here to bring this process about. Yes, Tim? Interesting one is that Hebrews 7, verse 2, where it talks about um, king of righteousness. Yes. King of peace. Yeah. yeah, that is a good one. Hebrews, what was that again? 7, verse 2. <laughs> Hebrews 7, verse 2, because that is the order that you're dealing with here. It's king of righteousness and of peace, right? Kings and priests is what we're going to be, the king priestship, but the king of righteousness and the king of Salem or the king of peace. So that's the process that's going on, or if you're English, the process, right, um, that is taking place to bring about this sea of glass, right? You get then to Revelation 21 verse 1, at the end of the millennium period, we find there, there is a new heaven and a new earth. So let's have Revelation 21 in verse 1, whoever's next. Revelation, sorry, Jonathan. 21 verse 1. 21 verse 1, got it. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Okay, so here you get a new heaven and a new earth, and in this case, there's no more sea, right? Well, why is that the case? Because if you cross-reference this to Peter, where we've been several times over the last little few weeks, you get to first or second of Peter, <coughs> chapter three. And Kara, if you could read this one for us, second of Peter, chapter three, and we are going to read verse ten down to verse thirteen. Second Peter three, verses ten to thirteen. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord because of which the heavens will be dissolved without, sorry, be dissolved being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Okay, so you see the, the wording there? I mean, this isn't the literal melting of the heavens and the earth because heavens is where God dwells, right? That's mm -hmm. where his, the heaven is his throne. So it's not like God's throne is going to melt away. It's the, the heavens and the earth, the rulership, right? And he says the new heavens and the new earth that are going to replace this. And notice the words there. There's going to be melting with fervent heat because it's a sea of glass mingled with fire, right? It's going to be a heaven and earth wherein dwells righteousness. The heaven is Christ and the saints. The earth is Israel and the nations. And that's going to have righteousness as well. So it's not like it's limited to just the saints. By the time the millennium is completed, all flesh is going to be done away with. It's going to be completely and absolutely gone. There's going to be no more death. Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So at that point in time, there will be no more flesh and blood. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. It's all going to be passed away. And so, at that point in time, it's going to be the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness. So just come over to Corinthians for a minute, because that's where that passage is, rather than me trying to ad lib it. Um, 1 Corinthians, chapter 16, and verse um, 50, because this is really talking about this time when there's a new heavens and a new earth. So we're just going to follow along from here. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Right, so flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So much for the Sistine Chapel. Yeah, <laughs> she's gone. Right, so flesh and blood, the nature that we have, has to change. It has to go away, right? And that's why um, the verse that we were just in, Second Peter 3, um, just to kind of keep on going there, you don't have to turn it back up. I just want to read you the next verse because this is where it brings it down to, to the level for us. Nevertheless, verse 13, we look for, a, according to his promise, we look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Wherefore, my beloved, seeing ye look for such things, be diligent that you are found of him, now notice the words, in peace, without spot, and blameless. Right? How can we be in peace? By being righteous. Because his peace, he lives, lives, lives with us. Not the peace of the nations, but the peace that comes from righteousness. The peace that, that transcends basically everything that you can think of in this world, 
all the yoga lovers and whatever else, you know what I mean? Like you can go out there and sit and, and you know, contemplate your belly button and whatever. And, and you'll get a, a certain degree of peace and meditation and tranquility, but true peace comes from being at peace with God, with having tranquility in our hearts and being in a way that we are just absolutely, there's no tossing of the sea, so to speak, in our minds. We're at total peace. A, because of forgiveness, and B, because of righteousness. We have chosen to walk in a right way. That is the true peace. That's the true inner peace that we're going to find. You're not going to find it in any of the ways that the world deals. I mean, I, I often liken it to, you know, like we talk about chemical imbalance. Sometimes you get somebody who's bipolar or whatever else, you know, and we need to bring them back. So they're, they're super extreme, you know, highs and lows and whatever else. So chemically... You can treat them, and you can give them whatever pill it is, and it can bring them back to level. But what is level? Level is sinful and going to die. You know, so the best you can do is restore them to the default state, which is death. So what God enables us to do is to go past that and to bring us to a state where is righteousness, which is not our righteousness, it's His righteousness, and that can take us past and we can be given eternal life in the kingdom of God to come. So there's going to come the time where there is no more sea. So that's the end part of Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21. That's the promise to him that overcomes. We get to rule with the Lord Jesus Christ, who sits upon David's throne, 12 throne, tw tw thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel, we reign upon the earth. We are involved in the subduing of the nations. Again, not for wanton bloodshed, but to bring them under the yoke and to instill into them righteousness. That's why it says, you know, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, right? So they bring the gospel of peace. This is what, remember angel Gabriel, the angels, you know, good tidings of great joy shall be to all people, right? This is the great joy. It's the changing of a wicked structure yes. into a righteous structure. When you look back over history, it doesn't matter how far you go, you pick any era, any age, any people, whether it's Islam, whatever. You go back to the height of the Byzantine, or not the Byzantine, but the, um, the Abbasid Empire, right? Islam at its absolute uh, finest. And there's the time when you've got um, science, medicine, peace, um, there's, there's an absolute calm over the entire Islamic empire. They are masters in medicine. They invent algebra. I could have done without that one, but you know what I mean? Like they are, they are masters of science. They have it all, right? So at the pinnacle of that empire, and what happens a few years later, the next bad egg comes along and it all goes, yeah. right? So like it's all at the hands of man. So even though one person might get things pretty good, and he might even be a Muslim, it doesn't take long, and it's all gone to heck, you know? Yeah. Same thing with the Christians. You might have a beneficent Christian ruler. Somebody who comes along, and, and regardless of doctrine, but let's say they, they instill a fairly fair system of practice, but the next guy comes along, and it all goes to heck. You look at that in the, in the time of the Bible. You know, you got Hezekiah, it's great. His son Manasseh, it's terrible, right? Josiah, it's great. His sons, it's a disaster. Yeah. You know, and, and you just look at this pattern, right? This is what man does. When it's in the hands of men, it's going to, to go to a disaster because we're flesh. The new heavens and the new earth is going to be about bringing righteousness and a righteous rule so that the people will benefit in a way that they've never benefited before. Total tranquility, you know? And that's whenever I see now, and we go up north or whatever else, you go to the lake, yeah. and you go out there and you see, um, or even Manitoula, you know, you go some mornings and you'll see that just total glass lake, you know, with a little bit of fog maybe on the top of it. I always think of this passage. That's the kingdom age. Yeah. Total tranquility. Yeah. No casting up mire and dirt. Mm -hmm. It's completely calm because the Lord has come and he has instilled calmness on the face of the earth. But, come back to Revelation 13, or 3, sorry. It's all dependent on us as to whether we're going to be there. Verse 21, to him that overcomes, 
I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my Father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the Ecclesiastes. Have to be willing to listen to what God says. And what he says is, I know your works, that you're neither cold or hot. I wish you were cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I'm rich, and I'm increased in goods, I don't need anything. And you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. So he says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door, and I knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and will sup with him, and he with me. But we've got to be willing to open the door. The word there is actually, I stand at the door, and I'm knocking. It's that same sense, right? Mm -hmm. I'm here, and I'm knocking. The question is, are we going to open the door or not? Yeah. So next week, we'll look at the chastisement of the Laodicean Ecclesia, and we'll consider, um, or not next week, sorry, two weeks from now, yeah. we'll consider um, what basically has God has said, or the Lord Jesus Christ says in his judgment of his people, and we'll look at it as we've done with all the letters, not saying, oh, terrible Laodiceans, you know, I thank God I'm not like them, publicans and sinners. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at it from the point of view is, is that me? Yeah. Can I fall into that same sort of mindset of, I don't need anything? And so we're going to go through those passages of him knowing our works, which we've looked at before, but we're going to zero in on the, the, the issues that he identifies here. Um, if you want to do some back uh, tracking on this a little bit, um, the series is online called The Man of One, which deals with the gold, the white raiment, and so on and so forth. Um, those are on the ChristadelphianResource.com site. Um, those classes were given, I think, at Manitoulin, I don't know, a couple of summers ago. Um, and that's, that's the series that's to do with the Man of One in Revelation chapter 1 that will be some good backfill. Next week, um, God willing, we're going to be down in Morristown uh, for their Prophecy Weekend. So there won't be a class because we'll be traveling back on the Monday. Um, so it'll be, God willing, in two weeks that we'll have our next class. Um, so next week is, I think, Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is a gathering in Brantford. Saturday. Fortunately, we won't be there. Um, but if you're really bored on Monday and want some, some work to do, you can go back and, <laughs> and take a look at some of those classes. Mm. So um, with that, we'll ask Brother Tim if he could close the word of